Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome very much to Seed to Soar. What path should businesses take to grow? Well, this session does what it says on the tin. I'm your host for this afternoon, Liz Barkley. And can I just say uh, now, before we kick off, I have been having problems with teams, so I do hope to stay with you right through till the end of this session. I know that it will be a really enjoyable session. I can't see you, the audience. I know you're there. I hope that you really do enjoy it. Uh, just uh, a piece of housekeeping to start with. The session's running on a webinar platform, so you will be on mute throughout. And that means sadly that we can't see you, nor can we hear you. You won't be able to pose your own questions. Please therefore uh, add your questions to the question uh, chat and we will put your questions to the panel members. Uh, I'll try to do them justice. Uh, please forgive me if I don't get them absolutely word perfect, but we will try to address as many questions as we possibly can. Now, I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I'm taking over as the Small Business Commissioner on the 1st of July, and so I need all the insights that I can possibly get into small businesses uh, <laughs> right from the beginning of my tenure. Um, a quick word from me because I have the mic. I have been working with small businesses, uh, the very smallest of small businesses for many years. The first uh, time I came across many small businesses was uh, when I worked for Citizens Advice in East Anglia and we were in the midst of the recession at the end of the 80s. We were losing a thousand small businesses a week. And uh, along with that, we were losing, people were losing their homes at the rate of 76,000 house repossessions a year. So it was a pretty terrible time. I moved from there to the BBC to set up the pilot of what is now the BBC's advice lines. I made 60 small business programmes for BBC Two, amongst other things. And I got to work with many small entities at all stages of their uh, seeding to soaring. Um, not everyone needs funding. However, uh, some think that funding is the answer and that if they get the funding they need, then they will obviously soar. But some actually need support, mentioning good advisors instead. Um, I wish I had a pound for every time someone has said to me, I thought if I had the funding it would fix the problem, but I spent it on fixing the wrong things. Um, and then I got the advice that put me on the right path. However, what I've also discovered is that the smallest firms who are in need of funding often need the smallest amount, amounts of funding and those small amounts of funding can be very, very difficult to get. Someone said to me the other day, I should have stretched much sooner. I should have grown my business quicker. I should have begged, stolen and borrowed to take on the people that I needed. If I'd done that, we'd be in an even better position now, but it was so difficult to find the amount of funding that we needed that we're three years behind where we should be. Well, that's three years behind in terms of jobs and development. So sometimes we simply need the seed in order to soar. Um, and firms need better answers than computer says no. So we are going to be talking to people today who can fully understand how to get the funding that's needed and how to help firms soar and to do that in the regions, because I think uh, in the regions is where the levelling up will happen. It's on the government's agenda. It's on the agenda of Justin Urquhart Stewart, who's going to be speaking to you shortly. Uh, it's on the agenda of regionally. It's on the agenda of Equus. Uh, they are your hosts for this afternoon. And let me now introduce our speakers. Don't forget those questions, questions coming in. The speakers this afternoon, Justin Urquhart Stewart, who needs no introduction really. However, I've worked with him for years, so I am allowed to say he is one of the best broadcasters that I've worked with in business. He makes investment and business understandable and enjoyable. Justin, some of your catchphrases that you've used on my interviews come to mind. That's as much useless as a hairbrush to a bold man, and I quote. <laughs> he was the co-founder and head of corporate development at the investment firm Seven Investment Management and founded regionally in 2020. Alistair Haynes is the founder and CEO 
CEO of Aquis Exchange, about which he'll tell us more. Suffice to say here that Aquis applies a subscription pricing model which works by charging users according to the message traffic they generate rather than the percentage of the value of each security that they execute, which can significantly reduce the cost of trading. Alistair began his 30 year plus career in the city with Morgan Grenfell and has held senior positions at a number of investment banks, including HSBC and UBS. And first, our first speaker, please welcome Jeremy Corn, who is CEO of Impact and Invest Limited. Jeremy is a highly experienced financial services professional with a deep commitment to ethical, environmental and social impact investments. And having had a long chat with Jeremy uh, a few weeks ago, I really do mean he is committed to that agenda. Um, Jeremy's one of his catchphrases is who doesn't want to make money while making a positive difference to the world around us or the society that we live in. So please welcome Jeremy Corn to tell us about the smaller businesses, Jeremy, that you've worked with and how the landscape of investment is changing. Welcome. Thank you, Liz, for the introduction uh, and thank you very much. Um, for uh, Acto Aquis and Region Leaf for inviting me on here today. I'm really looking forward to sharing a little bit of the message that I have about sustainable investment. Um, but before I start, uh, if you could just uh, um, bear with me a little bit, I'd like to play you a very short video. Uh, it's literally only one minute long and will set the scene for my presentation this afternoon. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about sustainable investing and really you couldn't pick a better topic for this webinar seed to saw to apply to impact investment. I think we've all come to realize um, that we need to do things to be a little bit more sustainable in the way that we do things. After COVID it's given us a great opportunity to try and change the way we do certain things and if you if you actually you stop and think about it we're all doing things very differently to how we were 20 years ago i mean nobody would have thought of recycling all the household waste 20 years ago the only thing that we considered really in terms of sustainability was how many miles per gallon you got from your car and then you still ignored that when you were making the decision of what to buy today as a society we're already far more aware of some of the issues and we're aware that things do need to change and there are great opportunities that are arising with companies that are addressing the changing needs that we actually face in this society. So let's say that we've all got a mythical and brand new investment portfolio that we're going to start planning from scratch and we want to look at how much sustainability we want to include within such a portfolio. So you could say, as is, you know, as a serious case, don't want to, I don't want to build any sustainability into any investment decisions I make. I want to have, you know, complete universe to select from. Um, and in which case, that's great. You're just chasing profits after all. That's the point of investment. But what happens? What if you take that to its kind of furthest extent? You know, what you really want is a nice juicy war so that you can invest into whichever company is building, is manufacturing the most bullets or building weapons of mass destruction at the cheapest cost. But you might actually say to yourself, actually, what I really want to do is to exclude certain industries. You might want to say, I want to exclude armaments. I want to exclude gambling, tobacco, alcohol, pornography. Then you start to already impose a set of loose but moral values 
on the investment decisions. But if you give that a little bit of further thought, why would you why would you not invest into a pornography company, but you would invest into a clothes manufacturer that uses child labor and exploits third world you know, in the third world? Why would you invest into a mining company that's causing irreparable damage to the environment, but you would exclude alcohol? So therefore, you're then starting to integrate. You're starting to integrate a set of moral values into the decision making which you're having about the investment choices which you make. You're already saying to yourself, I'm only really wanting to invest into companies that are treating and dealing with things correctly. And, and, and there's loads of evidence to suggest that companies that integrate ESG into their practices are likely to be the leaders and successful companies in the future. So very, that's a big moral value decision that you're already making in terms of investment performance. But then you could take a step further down the line and you could get to impact investments. And impact investments is where you're saying, I actually want to allocate some of my capital towards investments that have a clearly defined environmental or social focus. That their activities of these companies, their, their outcomes, their products, their services are designed to address a genuine and real issue that's around either in society or in the environment. The range is large. And for an impact investor, the journey which they go down on making investment decisions isn't that similar, isn't that different to a regular investment decision, except for the beginning of that journey, when it's the realization that actually your capital can influence decisions. It can influence and make change, and you can positively invest in line with your values. And that's why impact investment is often called values investment, because you're making value decisions about what things you would positively like to support. Now, just as for this hypothetical, mythical, brand new portfolio that we're constructing, just, just have in your head, just have a little thought about how much, if you were building this portfolio, you would want to put into, would you want to go no consideration at all? Or would you go to exclusion route, just integration, impact? Just have a little think about that for later on when we come back to it. Now, I suspect that everybody here, or most people who are listening today, um, would have an interest in values based investment. According to recent research came out actually this month from UBS, 90% of people have stated when well, UBS investors stated they would like to align their investment decisions with their values. 59% of people have said they're more interested in sustainable investment as a result of COVID-19 than they were previously. And I suspect we would have a very similar type of result if we did a poll across our audience today. 90% of people would say, yes, of course, I would like to align my investments with my values. So let's see actually whether that's happening or not. Again, data from UBS, 793.2 US dollars, billion dollars went into sustainable strategies or invest in a sustainable way in 2020. Of that, 132 billion was in exclusion strategies, so really just excluding the most harmful of industries. 512 billion went into integration, ESG, environmental and social governance, running your companies efficiently uh, in environmental, looking after your uh, in environmental factors, uh, incorporating environmental factors and social governance. 127 billion went into integration with sustainability as its focus, but only 13.1 billion went into impact investing. So in fact, about 1.8% of all the money that was earmarked for sustainable investments actually went to the 1.8% 1, 1 of that was invested in line with people's values and consciences. So if you're investing sustainably, the question is, why would you not want to invest into those things that mean something to you? And 1.8% of the sustainable investment total sounds really, really low. But actually, the total amount they've got invested is 4 trillion. And the, and the sustainable amount is only 18.9% of their total investor money under investment. So of that 18.9%, only 1.8% of it is earmarked for impact investments. And really, I would say this is the key issue that is causing a bottleneck. And as I'm sure 
Justin will mention later on, there's a blockage in the plumbing. For some reason, 90% of people say that they would like to invest in line with their values. Of that, 18.9% goes into sustainable strategies in whatever format they might take, but only a tiny fraction is actually invested in a way which is in line with people's values, impact investing. And what do you get if you pick a fund or you go with one of the major fund managers where you're getting a fund that works along exclusion or a very loose integration policy? Well, if you look at some of these are five funds that I've picked as, as really bad examples from five well-known fund houses, fund managers, where they have funds that are marketed as ethical or sustainable. So let's take acts of ethical distribution. Top 10 holdings, government guilds, government guilds, Diageo, Prudential, government guilds, government guilds, Gov Games Workshop, 3i Group. There is nothing wrong with that portfolio, but if you were trying to earmark money for sustainable investments and you had a portfolio like that, would you think that's meeting the requirements that you set out to invest in a sustainable manner? If you take Halifax Life, Apple, Amazon, Alphabeting, Microsoft, Walt Disney, Accenture, what is the difference between that type of portfolio and a mainstream portfolio? In what way are you supporting any sustainable causes by investing in Fundsmith Sustainable Equity, L'Oreal, PayPal, Microsoft, Unilever, four within their top five holdings? So if you come back to my original question, and if you think about that investment line of how you would build your portfolio and you said to yourself, I want to go with exclusion or I want to integrate a loose set of integration values. These are the types of portfolios you might end up with. And is that really what you're trying to achieve? Probably not. And then it makes you think, well, what is it that I really want to achieve? What, what are the, the, the what are the things that really motivate me? For me, I, I'm I'm very much focused on agriculture and alternative meat sources. That they are, you know, this is one of the changes we made as a family in our sustainability drive. My wife hates plastic. My sister-in-law invests into anything that's conservation based. We have lots of investors on our platform who go in for things like cancer research and circular economy. It becomes a matter of values of saying, actually, if I really want to try and influence society, influence change, I have to invest in a way that reflects my values. And that is happening with family offices. And they're leading the way on this. And this is again data from UBS. Family offices investing in line with their, with their values. 63% last year in 2020 prioritized education, 50% into healthcare, 40% into climate change. Family offices are leading the way in impact investing at the moment. And we can all learn a lot from the way that they are now taking a values based approach to how they want to choose to spend their money. So what do we do? We try and address the problem of, trans of translating the desire to invest in a values way to actually investing in a values way. And we do that by providing an opportunity and a platform for companies that make a direct impact to be put in front of the right investors. And what type of people do we deal with? What are the founders like? Well, obviously, um, some of them, you know, particularly a lot in the social sector, the people who want to change the world, some of them, their businesses are philanthropic. They need to be funded by grants. They need to be funded by philanthropy. philanthropy. We're not advocating that people need to start keeping chickens and wearing hemp sandals to change the world. It's the power of investment capital that can make a real difference. So the types of people that we work with, often the founders, the social entrepreneurs, are people who have lived with a problem and have seen a solution to it. Or they're people who are engaged often at a senior level with local authority commissioning authorities or within large organizations and they're chaffing at the bit because they know things could be done better and they've got the entrepreneurial spirit that's waiting to come out and try and do things better. A lot of the companies that we deal with on the environmental front have leading technology that's spun out from universities, research done by some very, very clever people. Um, these are the types of companies that are likely 
to be providing the types of technology and changes to our working practices that are going to be that are going to be mainstream in 20 years. And if you think how much society has already changed towards being more sustainable and the companies that have sprung up in that space uh, over the last few years, uh, and if you look at the alternative meat space, you know, look at companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat and and the remarkable journey that they've been on. This is where some of the real growth over the next decade is going to come from, from the smaller companies that are trying to change things in a positive way. And as society, we know that we want to change and be more sustainable and invest in line with our values. And we try on our platform to give that opportunity. So really, in terms of seed to soar, a lot of the companies that we deal with have great ideas. They're at the seed stage, but they're very, very scalable because the problems that we have with sustainability are global issues. We have a UK focus, but many of the companies we deal with try to try to address global issues. And if you actually think about the portfolios that you have or this mythical portfolio, and you said to yourself, how much money of my portfolio should I be investing in line with the things that I actually think need supporting? Whether that is circular economy, carbon reduction, climate change, whatever it is that you feel strongly about, why aren't you putting your money into something that actually addresses that? I'm not saying everyone should invest all their money into such and things, but should, there was plenty of data that's come out pre-COVID that suggested that approximately two thirds of investors would invest approximately a third of their money into sustainability. Yet yeah, that's not happening in reality. So that's really what I've got to say. I hope you've uh, you found it interesting. And on that note, uh, I'm going to hand back over. Thank you very much for listening. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Justin Urquhart Stewart. I shall try not to uh, send you all to sleep. Um, that was uh, that was very good, Jeremy. Fascinating to see. ESG has it moved from just a nice to have uh, a couple of years back, now actually essential. And of course, you're having companies now having to come out with proper statements. Even the oil companies having to say we will be carbon neutral by a date, which they don't really want to say particularly because hopefully everyone would have forgotten by then, but they won't. So it is now, I think, um, very exciting. No longer do we have greenwash. It's got to be more uh, more sensible. When we first started our first sustainable fund back in 2001, it was seen as a, a little bit of extra. Now it was seen as actually core um, uh, when I was leaving seven. Now, the issue I actually want to address is one of the elements actually that uh, Jim just touched on. The great thing actually in the United Kingdom is despite the issues we've had with, uh, with uh, COVID and the pandemic, over the past 30 years, we have become incredibly entrepreneurial. God knows how, because actually you go back years before that, we weren't really terribly entrepreneurial at all. Most people work for large corporations or they work for the government. Um, uh, they were in services, something like that, or they were a professional lawyer, accountant, something like that. Um, and if you were actually going to be uh, have your own business, oh my God, you're going to trade. Really not socially acceptable. Now, since then, it can't just be Dragon's Den or whatever, but we have become a nation of entrepreneurs. Sometimes by force, you lost a job. Uh, for example, the nation we have of consultants. Bear in mind, a consultant is just a euphemism for an unemployed banker. Um, but uh, actually what you've got is people going out with the bravery to go out and start their business. And I think that's very exciting indeed. Now, the big problem, of course, with that is it's all very well starting businesses. And we start more businesses uh, than France and Germany put together, which is remarkable. Uh, actually, on a level quite often with many of the US uh, states. Uh, so that is very exciting. The problem we have is how do you go from seed to source, seed to actually now being a growth business and surviving? We have lots of good ideas of actually how we start businesses, lots of new start funds and things like that, all of which are very encouraging and positive. And there's some very good tax breaks, EIS and such like to help you doing it. But how do you go from being a rather successful minnow into something larger? Unfortunately, Britain has normally established this by having something known probably like a shark, which goes around eating minnows, um, rather than necessarily encouraging minnows themselves to grow into something, well, not necessarily like a shark, 
for something larger and more successful. Where do you get the funding from? And this is the problem. Now, if I go back into a bit of history, and forgive me if I bore you by figures I've told some of you before, uh, actually, in this country, we used to have quite a lot of stock exchanges. And if you think the primary purpose of a stock exchange is to raise capital for business, that's the primary purpose of it. Buying and selling shares is a secondary purpose of it. You can't buy and sell shares till you've done the first bit first. I could easily argue that London Stock Exchange doesn't actually qualify as a stock exchange. Because actually, it's much more interested now in actually doing things such as collecting data, which is why I'm delighted to see Aquis coming in, operating as what I see as a proper stock exchange. But actually, what we had go back in 1945, there were 45 stock exchanges in Britain. Most of them were absolutely useless, run by silly gits in red braces who frankly hadn't got a clue, but were waiting for lunch. Uh, they didn't really work, but about seven of them did. The largest actually was Glasgow, where I worked, as you can tell, obviously, by my accent. Um, and uh, that was actually very successful. And that was actually where we originally started AIM. It wasn't called AIM in those days. Low cost, light touch, easy mechanism to raise local money for local businesses. Very straightforward. Taken over by London and now effectively ruined. But that's another issue not to whinge about today. If uh, Jeremy mentioned something about actually talking about the financial plumbing, and it is financial plumbing. It's part of this infrastructure which the London Stock Exchange took away, shut down all those regional exchanges. So how do you invest in a regional business? How, if you are in Newcastle, you wish to invest in a Newcastle business, not just a startup, but to help it grow? And the answer is, well, it's pretty difficult. In fact, almost impossible. So therefore, that's why we were focusing and established regionally precisely to try and address this. Not to replace all the good ideas that are out there, but to help actually provide that infrastructure, that financial plumbing, to enable whether it's regional funds, whether it's actually uh, uh, whether it's family offices, local pension funds, things like that, uh, and uh, professional investors to be able to invest in those regional businesses, sometimes in their own region or sometimes not elsewhere around the country. To help those regions actually have a better chance of raising their own profile, flying their flag and be able to say, look, they're great businesses, they're coming invest in here. So I can see in Yorkshire, you'd end up with the e uh, index, uh, no, the e bikes whinging 50 uh, uh, or the time T10 or something like that, of actually almost having regional indices to actually show how people were, well, those areas are doing. To help businesses actually then grow faster. That's crucial at moments like this, where we have a recovery coming through, we hope coming through, we hope the issue of uh, obviously COVID is being managed, managed out, or at least managed so we live with it, and we get back to really growing the economy. And we managed to make life a little bit more difficult with this, adding to Brexit and things like that, making life difficult to buy bangers in Bangor or things like that. But nonetheless, we have a great opportunity to try and do it. But you need to be able to get that capital through. Most of the capital operations are actually designed to be, well, in London, with the costs that go with London. Nothing wrong with London, but actually we've got an awful lot of talent, an awful lot of money elsewhere in the country. So let's find a mechanism of putting together those companies that need that growth capital. Those companies that need to make sure they want the right type of investors. How often do companies get to choose their investors? Most of them say, give us the money, sod the investors, we'll deal with them later. No, no, no. You want the right investors. Are they suppliers? Are they members of family, club, staff, management? What is? Are they even consumers? All sorts. Are they longer term investors, not punters, not three year investors? That's private equity. That's uh, venture capital. Nothing wrong with that. That's too short term in my view. Equity investment is five to seven year. Growing the business, punting the business and actually being able to do that. Put that together then with also then the regional advisors. Who are they? They're the regional corporate advisors, often linked to wealth managers, often linked to solicitors and accountants. They're already there and they get frustrated because they grow these businesses, work with these businesses from seedlings to something larger. They then go and get finance and it has to go to London and they then lose that business elsewhere. So we, there is the money, there is the talent uh, and expertise, and there are the companies that actually need the investment. All you need to do is put the plumbing together to enable that to happen. That we can actually do. Actually, they're making sure that in the Midlands and the North and the areas not in London, can actually making sure that they are getting now more investment, not just actually in their own area, but when you, people have more greater awareness of it, there's listings in those areas of companies, 
that they can say, actually, we'll start going after more businesses there and trying to attract more investment. That, I think, is going to be much more exciting overall. So actually having this sort of structure, I think, is going to be great for the future to be able to actually have a structure which can grow in the medium term, to be able to actually then have those businesses go on to probably Aquis, to onto the major markets, to actually see them grow. And they will be the ones that will be looking to possibly purchase other ones as well. So we've got all the elements together. We've got the Lego bricks. So see, mixing his metaphors. I'm sure you have plumbing with Lego bricks, but you know what I mean. If we could then put those together in a way which actually pulls upon those expertise which is already there, fulfilling that need, providing good returns to, uh, to investors, and using, as Jeremy said, those disciplines of actually having the right standards of business, which investors are looking for, businesses that behave well, you know, I want to be able to sleep at night knowing that investors, the things I'm investing in are behaving well. I want to sleep at night that my business is behaving well. And more to the point, if I'm not, actually making sure something's done about it. So this I actually find is very exciting. This does not need anything new. All the elements are there. So let's actually put this together. We've started already in the southwest and we'll be moving into other areas as well. We haven't made a big song and dance about it yet, because as far as I'm concerned with regionally, you make a song and dance when you've done something and prove that it's there. Without government money, no need for government opium, please, on this. There's more than enough. Keep it actually operating in a nice old-fashioned capitalist way, but behaving well. So here's to the excitement of actually making sure that we actually sustain and develop those start exciting startups and get them to grow from seedlings into something larger that they can actually properly soar in their own right. And we can help them go to that growth scale and no doubt they'll go on to Aquis and be successful there. Successful businesses, successful investors, and also successful advisors with it as well. What's not to like? Well, it's up to us to try and do it all. And certainly we've already started and it's looking successful. And we now go on to the next stage, which I think for next year is going to be even more exciting. Liz, back to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you very much for that impassioned um, argument. And also, I think you can have plumbing with Lego. You can have just about everything else with Lego. So why not plumbing? Uh, so let's go on to hear from Alistair Haynes, who is the founder and the CEO of Equus Exchange. And I think, Justin, you have given him uh, quite a good segue uh, into his presentation. So, Alistair, let's hand over to you as our third speaker. Um, how is Equus Exchange different from the LSE and what about the importance of alternative stock exchanges? How will this be different? Why? And why is now it's time? Tell us more. Liz, thank you very much indeed for, for the introduction. And Justin, thank you very much for, for all the sort of comments on, on Aquis. Um, I thought I would start off by just explaining a little bit of what Aquis Exchange Group is as a public company, and then really spend most of the time focusing on Aquis Stock Exchange, because you're absolutely right, Liz. What the country needs more than anything else is strong competition in the primary markets and the secondary markets, the trading of SMEs. So let me tell you, Aquis Exchange Group is one company and it has three different businesses. The original exchange actually trades 1,700 stocks across 15 different markets. These are the large cap stocks across Europe. And we differentiate ourselves from any other exchange in the world by being a subscription exchange. That means we charge people by message traffic rather than charging people by a value. In fact, we believe very strongly that exchanges are like telecoms companies. It is a network. And if you look at the effect of what subscriptions have done to the world, they have created in the Fortune 500 the fastest growing businesses. I can't see you all today, but I'm almost certain you will all have phone contracts, Spotify contracts, you'll have subscriptions with Netflix, you'll join Amazon Prime. And in every case, subscriptions change human behavior. And that is exactly what we've done with the Aquis Exchange. And that we've innovated also by creating a rule that prevented the proprietary trading firms from crossing the spread. Now, what does that mean? If any of you have read the book by Michael Lewis, Flash Boys, you'll know that there are certain people out there who have created um, a market, which a, a, a system which acts very, 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 very quickly. This is, the, this is the high frequency trading community. Now, we actually don't allow these people to come and trade on the bids and offers in our marketplace. Wasn't a popular move, 
But as a result, I'm sure most of you tonight will never have heard of Aquis, but we are the largest provider of liquidity of any exchange in Europe across those top 1700 stocks. In fact, we have 23% of all the liquidity at the very best prices. We execute just over 6% of all equity trading in Europe, and that makes us the seventh largest exchange group in Europe today. So what is that relevant to the primary markets? Well, we decided to go public two years ago, and it took us nine months to do so, cost us 1.4 million pounds to do so, and I get a spread in the market with a lack of liquidity. And we felt that that was very, very wrong. And so as a result, last year, we ended up buying the license through a business that we paid a pound for. Now, some of you will have heard of Nex or ISDX or OFX or Plus Markets. These, these are businesses that have been competing with the exchange for many, many years, but all have failed. So why is Aquis going to succeed here? Well, the first thing is I have this great belief that companies are like children. Now, for those of you who have children, I'm sure you'll understand this analogy very well. Children start small, they grow and they mature. But the difference between them and companies is that we send our children to primary school to start with, to learn how to learn. And we send them to that school and they have a particular way of teaching and a different behavior mechanism that is understood by the teachers. And once they've gone from primary school, we send them to secondary school, where again, you get a different type of teaching. They're learning to become adults and it's a different working environment. And ultimately, we send our children off to university. And there we have a yet again a different type of teaching and a different type of behavior. Now, the problem with the United Kingdom is that we end up with a one size fits all regulation and a non appropriate trading mechanism. We all know that companies that are two, three million pound markets cap, they trade differently, they act differently to those companies that are 200 million which again trade and act very differently than those companies that are three to five billion. And therefore we need to bring proportionality and we need to bring appropriateness. And that is exactly what we've done with Aquis. We've created a series of schools that interlink so that companies can raise capital early in what we call the access segment of the growth market. That's for companies up to 10 million pounds market cap. And we give them a set of rules. We give them a trading so that there is some capability of establishing price. And we then move those companies once they've uh, reached a particular level off into the, 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 the time into the apex market. And that is for companies that are anything more than 10, 15, 20 million, right the way up to 700, 800 million pounds market cap. And ultimately off to the university. We have one, one mantra that we keep on saying. We have to bring the public back into public markets and we need to get capital out to growth companies at a much earlier stage in a cheap, efficient and effective way. And once you come onto our market, why would it differentiate? Liz asked that question. Why would we differentiate from the London Stock Exchange? Well, the first thing is the standards are higher in the growth market. We ask people to do a prospectus, a growth prospectus, which actually means that it's a templated document. We did one a few weeks ago for a company called Samarkand Group, a 50 million pound business, now a 100 million pound business, a matter of weeks later, and it's a 150 page document. But prospectuses today, well, the lawyers that are listening today will know they are a thousand pages long. They take time to produce. It's costly, it takes, it, it, it's sort of, you know, it delays the whole process. We want things to be speedy, we want things to be less expensive. What else have we done in the growth market? We banned the selling short of stocks. Entrepreneurs should be allowed to go out and do what they say on the, on the tin. And they should be allowed to do that without having other people coming along and selling their shares. Market makers must be able to sell short, but nobody else, and they are protected. So we want to protect investors and we want to protect you as the entrepreneur as well. But we want to give you liquidity. So we've done a deal with six, soon to be nine market makers to make absolutely certain that once a company, even an early stage company comes to the market, 
it will have liquidity in its secondary trading. And we've done that with the market makers by giving them warrants in our subsidiary, the stock exchange business. Going back to the old days where stock exchange were owned by their members. And in return for that, market makers must make a price no greater than 5% for retail. You get six competing market makers providing capital, spreads narrow, volume increases. Since we introduced this in January, we've seen spreads decline by 60%, that's the bid and offer, and we've seen turnover increase by over 1,000%. Why is liquidity important to companies? Because that's the cost of capital. You want to raise, remember, children always need money at some point in time. Companies always need money at some point in time. And stock exchange today has always been the last port of call for a company to raise capital. And that isn't the right thing to do. A stock exchange should be one of the first ports of call. Once you've got your seed capital, once you've got your Series A capital, you should be looking at a stock exchange and allow the investors, the retail as well as the institutional investors to capitalize on the great success that you have. And we don't see that in the United Kingdom today. So what we want to do at Aquis is we want to get the retail participation. And today we've managed to get AJ Bell, we've managed interactive investors, Barclays, Jarvis, Pello, all sorts of online brokers directly connecting to us. We've got the market makers providing capital. We've got this protection for the issuer and for the early stage investors. And we have a simple process that is faster, quicker and cheaper. And that's the last word, cheaper. It doesn't, we're not pushing the fact that it's cheaper, but because we use technology, which is our third line of business, we sell technology, we're a tech company. By using this technology, templating things, we can get things done faster. So in summary here, what we want to do is become a NASDAQ of Europe. Why do we say that? Because today everybody thinks of the London Stock Exchange and it's not the London Stock Exchange. It's the United Kingdom Stock Exchange and it should be a stock exchange. And that's what we want to be, which creates great value for the companies and provides liquidity and capital for companies. If you look at what NASDAQ did in the 1990s, all these odd companies came along called tech companies. They didn't go to the New York Stock Exchange because people didn't know how to value these companies. And a lot of people were going, it's a bubble, it's a craze, it's never going to exist. Well, look what happens today. We have 3 billion people digitally communicating with each other around the world, digitally shopping, digitally gaming, digitally entertaining through music and films. And these people, these 3 billion, will ultimately digitally create their wealth. And stock exchanges of the future have got to be able to be there for these new economy businesses, these new economy stocks, as well as the traditional stocks, which will be, have be accessed in a digital way. If we go back to NASDAQ and everybody talks about nowadays, we're at a bubble, it's going to break. Yeah, it did in 2000 with the dot-com bubble. It burst, but out of it came Facebook, Google, Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon. You can just keep on going and the same thing will come here. We have fantastic companies in the United Kingdom. In fact, all over Europe, but especially in the United Kingdom. And what they need is a stock exchange that can actually provide them that capital and what we want is to make quite certain that we work with these companies, which is exactly why we want to be on these roadshows around the country. Because again, unlike the London Stock Exchange, we want this to be a partnership, a symbiotic relationship. We want the companies that are on our market to grow. And those companies want us to succeed so they get a higher valuation. Now, since we've taken over this business, next week we'll have our 100th security listed. We've got over 50 new companies coming onto the market. If I look at the APEX segment, there are 21 companies now with a market cap of over 81 million. We have over the, the 70, 80 stocks that sit on the access segment. Many, many of them started as one, two million pound businesses. Average market cap there is 14 million. We want a place where people can grow and we want it to be easy to access and we want the people of the United Kingdom, both retail and through the wholesale institutional investors, to capitalize on 
the fantastic things that we have in this country. And at that, that's why Aquis is in existence. And that's why we're so keen on working with the likes of Jeremy and with Justin, because I think tonight you've actually heard the three stages of how companies can get financed at an early stage and make quite certain that you saw. Back to you, Liz. Thank you, Alistair. Um, absolutely impassioned. The three of you are, are incredibly passionate about this, and I think this is what really makes the difference uh, when you're trying to deliver messages to an audience, and this audience has started to ask quite a lot of questions. So let's see how many of these we can get through. But let's just start with you, Alistair, because we are talking about stock exchanges and we are talking about um, raising standards, boosting liquidity, increasing uh, institutional investment and retail investment. Do you think there will be a time that there will be regional stock exchanges again? I'm not a believer that we will necessarily have regional stock exchanges because you've got to think, what is a stock exchange? Uh, you know, I often say to people, a lot of our early investors came, can I come and see the stock exchange? It must be so excited. Well, actually, it's a sort of very sort of computerized data center in Slough and another one that sits in the center of London, which actually has access. I'm not even allowed to go into it. Uh, even as the founder and owner of the business, the security is remarkable. It's probably the dullest place in history to go and see. So we don't necessarily people want to go and see a stock exchange. But what we have got that is fundamentally different is when I started in this game and I've been around for 40 odd years here is that, yes, investment was always local because communication wasn't the same thing and I got no information. What is so important about a stock exchange? And one of the things we offer is every company that sits in our apex get automatic access for quantitative research, which is transparent machine readable through a machine learning and artificial intelligence company. That's something that we need to get out so everybody can evaluate and look at these companies. So what's happened is we have got this digitalized world. And this digitalized world means that you can get research and information, not just what happens locally, but actually what happens over a very wide space and that's important that's what technology technology can do to you now i think london has made a fundamental error and i think london uh in 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 the, in the predecessors to to when we took this company over used to call themselves a london exchange i totally agreed with what justin said london is a part it's an important community for financial services but it is not absolutely not the engine room of innovation for the united kingdom and we need to make quite certain that people know that there is access and they can have access. So maybe we won't have regional stock exchanges, but we'll certainly have regional places for people locally to come and talk and meet and discuss and all those things. Well, I think that's really important. Justin? Yeah, those regional hubs that you'll find will develop because after all, you look at the amount of business that's actually focused already on Leeds, Glasgow, Edinburgh, these already have got big centres. What's happened though is when by London, the way it operates, you've started just pulling that business away. So actually the technology will allow this to actually develop again very, very quickly indeed, um, to actually enable greater local communication, raising that profile and then greater interaction between them. What I found fascinating is the amount of interest actually from one region to another uh, that's cross fertilization. Actually, people in the uh, example I had in my mind was actually um, in the uh, brewery and pub industry in the northeast, actually looking to invest in the southwest because they didn't know where to go, how to go. Once you actually raise the profile of these areas, then you're actually going to attract more attention that people know they can do it. The technology makes that just so much easier. But is it enough to have these regional hubs? Do we not need? much more centers of the excellence um you know where we're pulling together the expertise we're pulling in the universities we're pulling in the incubators we're pulling into particular areas and that's where you have to then make sure that that then you've actually got the, the infrastructure linked together because you've got you see the, the all the the tech hubs there but you've got silicon glen silicon fen silicon gorge you may make up any other variation these are all effectively hubs that have been developed by by technology and it's fascinating to then see then how they then grow and develop. Now, actually then link that together so that there's then more opportunity for further external investment coming in. And then you will actually find that they'll be able to grow faster. Um, and it's that growth which is actually so, so vital. 
And we've been our own worst enemy. Don't wait for the politicians to do it. They don't understand it. They wait for the Treasury. They don't understand either. Uh, we can actually do all of this ourselves. We have to teach the regulators, because, of course, most of them haven't been in business. So they don't understand these things. Um, but what we do need is actually people to participate, actually come in and actually come in and actually sort of uh, have a look and see how the, these uh, elements are operating. For itself, with, with Regine and also Aquis, come in and join it. Go and have a look. Try out to see how this works and see where they would participate. I cannot at the moment find many advisory firms that would not benefit somewhere along the line in terms of their business by making sure that they've got more involvement in this. So servicing their existing clients, attracting more clients, uh, helping investors uh, with that and their long term value they're creating for them and their own business. What's not to like? Um, let me, Jeremy, just bring you in on the second question. What's the benefit of investing into the region? So, I mean, Justin's very passionate about this, but from the impact and invest point of view, what is, from your standpoint, you know, looking at the impactful and sustainability angle of this, what is the benefit of investing into the region? I think the point's already actually really been made, and I'm going to just kind of reinforce it. The talent that's in this country isn't just focused on London. There are people with good ideas, with good research, with good brains, with good opportunities, and with the drive and the expertise to make this work in all parts of the country. It's very much easier to find those companies that are based in London because the London system seems to give to, to, to bring them forwards, to give them a little bit more exposure. It's a little bit more tricky to find the best opportunities outside. And that's why I think it's really important that develop, whether it's regional stock exchanges, regional hubs, it's, it's really important that as society kind of rebuilds in after COVID, that emphasis is placed on finding the best opportunities outside and in the regions. Um, having said that, and you, you're dealing with the smaller companies, and of course that's what I'm obsessed about, the you know the zero to 49 uh, employees, etc. Are smaller companies who are looking for investment, and this is another question from the, the chat, um, are smaller companies looking for investment difficult to explain to investors when it comes to explaining the risk that they might be taking? Can I, I, I can I start on that one? Because I mean, here we are as a company. I don't think size of number of people should be any form of definition. And I think the government often gets this wrong. Um, we actually have 50 staff, so we're sort of in that naught to 49 almost category. Uh, I regularly go onto platforms and say that's slightly less than the catering departments of the national exchanges. It's just because we use technology, we're a lot more efficient. So it's not about the number of people, it's what you do. And I think this message does need to get across. One of the things we do that's very different to, again, any stock exchange in the world, is that when you come to IPO on our market, we will talk with you at an early stage. It starts with a suitability letter. We will have discussions with you. We don't want you to spend huge advisor fees and broker fees up front. That, that's a waste of money. We want to talk to you and understand your business model. And we understand that business model with you. And yes, we can reject at that stage. We've rejected eight companies this year. Um, but we, you know, we've, we've got 50 odd, as I said before, coming. And, and it's getting to understand what the growth story is. So as long as you can explain your story well to an investor, then you will find your money. Not necessarily, I'm guaranteeing an acquis, but you will find your money. It's all about how you present, not about the number of people. Just there's, a, there's a key issue here, and this goes from, from the investor right the way through to the companies. And that is the fact that we do not educate people in this country about finance. Yeah. Whether it's from private individuals trying to work out their pension, they don't find out what they need in their pension until they're about to retire, which is far too late. Uh, but people said, where do you get money from? Where do you get? No one tells you. And you end up only with the people who are trying to flog you something. And so you're seeing at the moment the whole raft of private equity uh, deal junkies going through at the moment. And that apparently is seen as the way you actually have but probably the wrong type of capital. Nothing wrong with private equity or venture capital. It has its place. Is it debt? Is it equity? What type of equity do you want? How do you want to structure it? And for a lot of people, they are trying to, they, they are trying to run their business, they're good at running their business, they don't understand the finance of it, how they should try and structure it efficiently. And it's hardly surprising because that's not their job. 
So we need to be able to make sure they've got uh, clear uh, advice as to what sort of structure of finance they need. Is it debt? Is it equity? How that changes over time? And this then comes back to my point about getting the right investors in there who are aligned with what you want to achieve as well. So you say to investors, and certainly when we've got people coming onto the regionally platform um, and they're saying, OK, what do you want out of your investors and what are you going to give those investors? At what stage can they come out, be able to trade their way out in due course? Uh, what sort of scale and time and value? So everyone understands that. And every company is going to be very different. There's no cookie cutter with this one. Uh, and that's where the regional advisors are so important because they then make sure the businesses are investment ready, they're investable, making sure they've got the right structures in place and getting the right sort of debt and matching those up then with the right investors. But I, that comes back to the point that I made right at the beginning. I think sometimes it's not just finance that small businesses need. It's the support, it's the advice, it's the expertise. Um, and actually we, uh, and I include you in this, Justin, we as the press and media are not good at explaining the role of business in the UK economy, the importance of business in the UK economy, and why people shouldn't feel that business is just out to rip them off, which is what the consumer mm -hmm. thinks. Jeremy. I'm just going to add something about investor engagement. I think that very much when you're dealing with the smaller, smaller companies, SMEs, um, it's very much about the investor getting to understand and engage with the company before they invest. I think the days of people looking just at a business plan and investing at arm's length based upon what they've seen on paper are, are behind us. And certainly within the impact space where people are investing into something that they uh, have an affinity for, uh, I don't think very many of our investors actually progress without knowing the people behind the company, understanding their motivations and their passions, and therefore they actually do get to understand really what the risks are firsthand by knowing a little bit more about the company than just a paper exercise. And I think that's something that's brought very much about by, as we've talked about the change in technology, um, because we are actually able to, to introduce an investor that's in Manchester like we are to a company that's operating in Somaliland. So, you know, that was never possible previously. Can, can I just add on that? Sorry, uh, which, which is a point that Justin made that I wholeheartedly agreed on. It's probably the question we get asked most as an exchange, even though we're not an advisor ourselves, which is what sort of investors? If we have a number of investors, how should we pick what the cap table, what it actually looks like? And that is really important because you need a mixture. It's why we say so many, so often we need the public back into public markets because you get an IPO and it's just institutional investors. And if the institutions love the story, they don't sell. And as a result, you have no liquidity. If you have no liquidity and you want to raise more capital, then actually your cost of capital has risen. So it is important to find those who actually do want to hold your stock on a short term, those who do want to hold it for a long term, those who are family offices, those who are regional, those who are international. And if you can build that up together, then you get a really, really good investor group. And it's, you know, one thing that a lot of people also say is, oh, but if I go public, I lose control. I would say quite the reverse. If you go private equity, you lose control. If you go public, you actually have a guaranteed price every day and you don't lose control. And that is really key. Well, there are a couple of very specific questions on that. I was just smiling about the, uh, the private equity, uh, having known quite a few people get uh, kicked upstairs to the board and then kicked off completely. <laughs> I get your point. Um, but there's a couple of questions here. One, I started my company in logistics software about three years ago, and we got decent, we've got decent cash flow but don't anticipate becoming profitable for a few years yet. I think flotation would help uh, my ability to get new business now, but are pre-profit companies allowed to IPO? And the second one is we're a family business and want to stay that way. Does that mean an IPO isn't for us? Who wants well, to pick that I, one? I, I'd like to answer both of those, which is absolutely revenue, yes, you know, we don't take if you're coming in with a PowerPoint presentation and you don't have revenue, then I think you really are at the early stage. Pre-profit, many of our companies are not uh, are, are pre-profit. 
Um, and that isn't a problem at all. If we can see the path to profitability, we have absolutely no issues at all. In fact, we'd welcome you because we tend to think that's the early stage company that should be coming into the access segment. And that's the, how you can really start and you can gain, you know, get proper capital to establish your business. Family businesses, absolutely. Um, if I name some of the companies on our, on our market, Shepherd Neem, it's been a family business for 200 years as a brewing business. Daniel Thwaites, uh, Adnams, these, these have been very, very family related over the years. All are companies that are now quoted on the Aquis Stock Exchange. Again, it's the fact of not losing control. And of course, the great advantage of being on a growth market like us, no inheritance tax. So that is a massive advantage for family businesses. If you want to have transfer for family, no inheritance tax, no stamp duty, VCT eligible, EIS eligible. These are great, great things which are gifted to growth markets. And there's only us and the AIM market, which we obviously don't talk about, are the only people you can do that on. Justin, you want to come in? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, absolutely right in terms of this issue of it's not uh, about profitability. It's the business plan itself, the, the development of the business over the medium term. That's what the, the investors should be looking at, and that's what they're buying into. Companies can take a long time to get profitability if they've got to build a, an infrastructure over time. It, every single one's going to be different. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to go for the quick, sharp profit. It's a longer term, maybe, maybe quite a slow growth for those businesses. Everyone's going to be absolutely different. It's whether it makes logic sound business sense. And again, matching up the return that the investor's looking for. Are they actually looking for something which is going to be giving them a dividend? Well, in which case, they're probably unlikely to be seeing that. Are they going to see longer term capital growth? That's is that the different. You look at the different businesses, they all vary enormously. And I agree with what Alistair said in terms of family businesses. Well-run family businesses actually give it the style, the brand, and actually protect it. Actually, some of the worst things you can have is actually families themselves on their own running businesses actually ends up being rather divisive, uh, as we know how well families get on with one another. Uh, forgive me, Liz, I'm going to have to despair off quite soon. Um, thank you very much for a great time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Justin, thank you ever so much. Uh, we'll forgive you for uh, disappearing. That's uh, great, but thank you. It's been terrific. Thanks all for all your insights. Alistair and Jeremy, I'm keeping you here because there's still <laughs> more questions uh, to deal with. Uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, for the, the next question is, for a large part, it is business that will deliver the levelling up agenda. So, what role do politicians have and what more can they do in supporting or facilitating investment in small business? Um, and again, each of you will answer that from your perspective. But it, it is a really interesting question, given Justin's previous remarks about how little politicians <laughs> understand about business. Uh, who's going to kick that one off? Well, I, I, I would actually like to throw that back at you, Liz. Because I think with your role coming up as the Small Business Commissioner, it would be really interesting to hear your views on uh, on what could be done from a government legislative um, standpoint, really, to help small businesses. Well, I, uh, Jeremy, as you know, don't take up the post until the beginning of July. And so I'm being very, very diplomatic about this now because there is still a Small Business Commissioner in place and I would not step on his toes. But can I say to the audience and to you and to Alistair, I want to hear from you come the 1st of July and I will tell you then what I think. But we do definitely have uh, a very important role to play at the Small Business Commissioner's Office in acting as a bridge to a certain extent between the issues that we are seeing coming in from small businesses. Late payment is our main remit at the moment. That may or may not be extended. There's been a consultation. Uh, if it does go out to consultation, we will be dealing with more of those issues between businesses. Uh, we will have more insight into what's going on and definitely uh, the ear of the politician will, the politicians will be extremely important in trying to get those messages across. But for the for the meantime, that's all, <laughs> all I'm going to say. Suffice to say, I've got a strategy document and uh, I've done a lot of thinking right about it. Um, Alistair, what? Yeah, what's well, the politicians? Uh, very interesting because uh, if Justin was here, I'd say I don't disagree with him on many things, but I do on this one here. I think in this case here, politicians today in a post-Brexit environment are being more uh, communicative than I've probably ever seen in my life. I sat down with Paul Scully, who is the small business minister, uh, two weeks ago, 
remembering, of course, that he was also the Minister for London. So I thought he had a sort of conflict of interest prior to that. Uh, he was incredibly open. He hadn't heard of Aquis, which was, of course, our fault. But he was fascinated by the fact that getting capital out to SMEs is a really, really important part because, you know, SMEs supply so much in the way of employment, in the form of tax. And of course, our strategy, and a lot of people have said, Alistair, you know, go and get a big company to come and list on your exchange and then everything's done. And I said, absolutely, that's not our strategy. We want to get three or 400 SME growth companies onto our exchange, just as NASDAQ did all those years ago. And out of them, we're gonna get 50 unicorns. They'll all end up in the university of exchanges at the very end. And that's how you grow. That's how you change the economy. That's how we can get employment up. And when I said that to, you know, to, to the people I've met in government and, and various politicians, they start to salivate because they get that there is now a mechanism for this to work, which in the past, I bet most of the audience listening tonight have thought going to a listing is arduous, costly, not appropriate, all these things that you get this very stuffy image. And frankly, we did. One of the things I, I believe in, you know, I, I am a baby boomer, the end of a baby boomer. The concept of buying stocks was always about gentlemen, not often women, but very much men's clubs discussing stocks. And it was a privilege to own equities. All of that is a load of bull. It really is. The market out there today is done by the average age of these younger people who are going to have to create wealth by investment. And these people are a massive source of capital for great companies. And we need to get the two together, which is why I talk about this digitalization and this new economy type exchange, which moves away from this stuffy approach that exchanges have always had in the past. Um, which brings me on to uh, another issue, which is not a question here. There is a there is a question I want to come back to, um, but um, Jeremy, the whole net zero issue is the is the big, big impending issue. Net zero by 2050. Will investors, do you think, increasingly want to see small businesses, even the very smallest firms? Um, putting plans in place to reach net zero and how soon and how are they going to do it? And do you, uh, you know, just to mention young people again, uh, young people want to work with firms with a purpose. Are they themselves, are we going to get the best talent into the firms that are most likely to be dealing with these sustainability net zero uh, ESG issues? Okay, so the first thing I would like to say on this is that it really isn't just young people who are interested in ESG sustainability net zero. I would say we get as much interest from the elderly, the retired, um, the, from people who are in the working years, uh, perhaps around my age, as much as we do from Generation Z. This is something that is appeal across the board. Everybody looks out their window, sees the news, sees the pollution. You know, everybody sees something that, that they think is important. And this is something now that is universal. As far as net zero goes, I think that um, this is a global challenge that is going to have to be addressed from uh, from top to bottom. So it has to be led by international organizations like the United Nations, that has to filter down to governmental policy, that has to filter down to implementation at a regional level, and that then has to filter down to each one of us doing our own individual bit. And if that happens, then there is absolutely no reason why we can't, a, as, a, as a race, we cannot undo the damage which we've done and turn back and be there well before 2050. But if we don't start from the top, and follow that chain all the way down to an individual level, then you can have as many policies and as much talk as you want, but you won't achieve it. What is interesting is that already, and you'll see this increasingly, those companies that are doing something to positively address that issue are being targeted for rapid expansion. Whether that's coming through, through governmental pressure, through um, regulation, legislation, or whether it's just coming from investors looking at it and saying, this is what I want to be associated with. We're already seeing a premium uh, or, or a premium of attention 
towards companies that are actually addre positively addressing these issues. And I think as we get closer to 2050 and regulatory fines start to increase on companies that are failing to meet these targets, um, as there are positive tax incentives and more positive um, fiscal measures to encourage companies that are trying to address these issues, I think you'll see that even more so. Alistair, would you agree? Uh, I do, but I would bring in proportionality because growth companies and small companies need to know that they don't have the same um, uh, ability to spend cash on things that they need to affect them straight away. So th the key between a growth company and a large conglomerate like sort of a BP and HSBC is, you know, we're looking at trying to get that right level, that right balance between what is appropriate, what is proportionate. Uh, because, you know, we look at 30 years. I think a lot of people who are running their businesses think, well, 30 years time is, is not my problem because the average tenure of a chief executive is somewhere between sort of six to eight years. Therefore, um, you know, do I do I really have to worry that's the next person? And the answer is yes. If companies come to us and they happen to be and they want to be with an ESG mark, then they absolutely have to express and show a very, very clear plan and set out various targets as to how they're going to achieve this. Other companies don't want that. They don't want to be part of that segment of the market. They simply want to grow their business now. And again, we have to bring proportionate regulation and propor pro proportionate mechanisms. You know, you don't, you can't have a board of five or six people. That's probably more than the costs and your loss making, you know, and then how is that board constructed? How diverse has that board got to be? Well, at the early stage, you want to get the best people, simply the best people for that company to get it towards that profitability. Now, they must have a best endeavors. They must be trying to seek that because any any normal person will think actually a diverse board is a good board. I mean, it's just common sense. But sometimes in certain segments, certain industries, that's really tough to achieve. And I think we need to be proportionate for those businesses and allow them to grow. Because what is so important is we want this economy to grow. And in the, think about it, the people who fund it are the people who are really going to make the difference between whether the economy does or doesn't. Um, a lot of small businesses are scared about this. They're scared about the costs because, of course, yep. they worry that there will be attendant costs that they can't afford. Jeremy? Well, I think I think very much when we're talking about small businesses and environmental and social governance, then the legislation and the regulation has to be proportionate. And exactly as Alistair was saying, there are certain companies that are they're not of the size or geared to be able to achieve that. But the original question was addressing climate change and net zero by 2050. And that is something that cannot be left for the next CEO or the CEO after that. Because if you leave it for another 50, for somebody else's tenure or six or eight years, it will be too late. It will be. Because we have to make change starting today and that change has to increase in pace to 2050 to be able to reach a very challenging target. So although I completely agree where it comes to proportionality in respect of uh, environmental and social governance and the requirements that fall upon small businesses, because you do need to, you don't want to do anything that's going to constrain the growth of those companies. If we don't have a framework for addressing climate change by 2050 that is in place today, we will not meet those targets. Um, and I quite often hear businesses say, oh, well, uh, we've got 10 years. That's a long time. We don't need to start yet. <laughs> and I think that message is quite clear. Uh, 2050 is not that far away. Uh, there is a question here that uh, says, is there a kite mark type of designation for an ESG company? Interesting question. And I would, and I'm sure Alistair's got some interesting things to say about this issue as well. Um, we come across greenwashing all the time. Every company that's in the UK at the moment will tell you that they have got good ESG practices. Many of them haven't changed their practices. They've just changed the way they describe them. And that is an issue. It is an issue because actually it isn't enough just to say we are doing things differently we are doing things right you actually have to be doing things differently or doing things right so we work particularly with the impact group 
which do an impact accreditation. So the companies that we work with, we bring them down and accreditations. The companies span out of what was originally the social stock exchange. There's a little bit of connection with Aquis in, in the past in its previous guises. But the, the idea of an independent external validation for a company to be able to quantify the impact or the environment or the sustainable impact of that organization, I think for the right companies is essential, but shouldn't be imposed upon everybody because, you know, for some companies it's, um, you know, the resources needed for that are going to distract. But in general, if you are going to want to work with a company that is specifically setting out to be sustainable in their practices, then they are going to want to demonstrate that. And the only way you can demonstrate that is to buy is by uh, acquiring the data to, to back up your claims. Alistair, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm, I, funny enough, I read an interesting article today which called Greenwash to Hogwash, um, you know, which I think was was nicely titled. Well, unfortunately, the title was slightly better than the article. But I, I, I think there's there's you know there there is this point about um, the standards. The standard has got to be set. There is no single standard today, and that makes it very hard for companies because if you don't know what you're trying to to achieve, then it's very very difficult to set those goals. Um, and you know, it, it's almost like try my best. It, it will try my best isn't good enough in this case here. Uh, so I've spent time talking to regulators. I've spent time talking to people saying we need to really try and find if we can't get a global standard, then at least let's try and set a regional standard that people can aspire to. Because when that is being forced down on somebody, then we actually know what rules we're going to play by. And therefore, then people can invest easier because their decision is based on a standard that they recommend. And we see that in indices, you know, what type of indices, whichever company it is. And you should see the same thing happening when it comes to ESG. And I think there will be a battle. I think there's a lot of people out there now with different marks, different standards. And I think what we need to do is getting a come together moment and regulators and politicians, dare I say, trying to actually establish what is acceptable for the industry. And in a perfect world, the industry should decide. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're coming very close to the end. Um, and also there's a question here for you, is uh, Aquis available for Middle East based businesses? Uh, that's a very, I can answer that, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's very quick. So, a last question from me for the two of you. Um, you, I don't know which one of you said, uh, and I think it might have been you, Alistair, over the next few years, smaller companies trying to change things will be the drivers of change, of innovation, of job creation, etc. Um, to what extent do you think they are well enough equipped, equipped, well enough supported? What's missing? What's the piece of the jigsaw that would really allow those small businesses that are desperately champing at the bit to take the risks, to be innovative, to be creative, to really get on and drive the economic recovery? Well, I think there's two answers. One, which I say almost at every single meeting, there's a, a think tank called New Financial, and I get asked the, every, we all get asked the same question. They say, what is your wish? My wish is that in the education of everyone in this country, we don't just have maths, English, you know, et cetera. We've got to have, you know, it's reading, writing, arithmetic. You've got to have finance. You've got people have got to have confidence in 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 that finance. That's really really important. And the other thing is, which I think one of your questions alluded to, was access to capital at an earlier stage. One of your one of the viewers talked about. I know I could grow my business more if I could have access to capital, and that's a confidence thing. Confidence is done by markets providing an easier access and an easier understanding. So part of that is education. Part of that is something that we as a new exchange as such have got to get out there and do. And the other thing is about getting confidence with the invet the actual entrepreneurs themselves to be able to go out and know that they can raise that capital. If you know, you might not need it, but if you know you have the ability to get it, you gain that confidence, your business changes. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, from my perspective, really, it's uh, what I would perhaps like to see is people actually putting their money where their mouth is. So we all have something that's important to us. 
I would like to see people actually supporting those causes or those industries, those technologies, addressing those issues that are important to them. And what I want to say is that it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you all this afternoon. Alistair, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Jeremy, if you can still hear us, thank you. I noticed you uh, trying to silence somebody in the background. I've been battling with my cat who's been absolutely determined. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much indeed for all of your questions. Uh, thank you to the absent Justin who uh, had to leave us early. And hopefully this is the first of these rather than the, the, the one and only of these sessions. And uh, hopefully there will be time to answer more of your questions next time around. Please look out for more regionally events coming up in future. Uh, Alistair, Justin, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed. And Rob, Thank you for keeping the show on the road. I apologise for the fact that teams didn't like me very much earlier on. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. Good night. Mm -hmm.